Live and uninterrupted, the New Jersey gubernatorial debate. Sponsored by WCBS-TV, KYW-TV, William Patterson University, The Record, and Asbury Park Press. Here is your moderator, CBS2 anchor, Christine Johnson. And good evening. Tonight we're live at William Patterson University in Wayne, where the candidates for New Jersey governor will square off in one of only two debates this election season. We bring you tonight's debate in cooperation with William Patterson University, CBS3, our sister station in Philadelphia, The Record, and also the Asbury Park Press. This debate is sanctioned by the New Jersey Election Law Enforcement Commission. Tonight, we welcome State Senator Barbara Buono and Governor Chris Christie. Joining me tonight to question the candidates, Alfred Doblin from The Record, my colleague Chris May, CBS3 anchor, and John Skuniagin from the Asbury Park Press. The candidates will have one minute to answer each question and 30 seconds for a rebuttal. By coin toss, Senator Buono, you get the first question. You're a Democrat in a blue state, yet you're trailing in the polls by 30%. You're going against a Republican governor who has been endorsed by 49 elected Democrats. Why are you having so, so much problems gaining traction in this campaign? Don't let the glossy magazine covers and the late night wisecracks fool you. There is nothing that's funny about what's going on in New Jersey and there's no amount of YouTube videos or late night shows that will erase the fact that we have 400,000 people out of work. We have the highest unemployment and the lowest rate of job creation in the region. We have 20% higher property taxes. But politics is not supposed to be about entertainment. This is about you, your life, and your children. Those, no denying those are the facts, but we only have so much time to answer each question. Well, and we, we really would like to know why your campaign is having so much problems gaining traction. You know, this is a blue state, and uh, people are just beginning to focus on the race. And I will tell you this, I've had a lot of opportunity in this state. I grew up, I was on my own since I was 19. My dad was an immigrant from Italy, and that opportunity wasn't Republican or Democrat. And the people that are really going to go to the polls and vote aren't politicians that have their backroom politics and their, their deals that they conduct behind closed doors. The people are, that are going to be coming to the polls to vote are those 400,000 that are out of work. Are those right, Senator Buono, I'm sorry, your time is up. I would like to know, though, I mean, a lot of this does have to deal with name recognition. So what about Washington? Would you like some help from Washington? Maybe President Obama coming here to campaign with you? Well, you know, I'm focused on the people of New Jersey. There's only one person up here that's running for governor, and you're looking at her. You know, I'm focused on the people that I meet on, on the main street, in the barber shops, and I have to tell you, when I meet them, they, my message resonates. They know that I get it, that I know what it's like to be on food stamps, to be without a job, and to make that call to the welfare office. I get their struggle because I've lived it, and those right. are the people that are going to vote on November 5th. Governor Christie. Well, I'm proud of the Governor 40... Christie, I'm sorry, I have a separate question, actually, oh, separate for you. Questions. Definitely. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> you champion anti-bullying campaign, yet you've used words like stupid, idiot, jerk, and you called one state senator an arrogant SOB. By using and by choosing that type of language, are you sapping the dignity out of the governor's office? No, in fact, quite the opposite. You know, what the people in New Jersey want is someone who's real and will tell them the truth as he sees it. And that's what I've done for four years. I've looked people in the eye and told them the truth, sometimes truths that they were uncomfortable with, sometimes truths that they didn't necessarily want to hear. But that's what leadership is about, Christine. It's about telling people the truth as you see it. And, you know, uh, at the end of the day, um, from my perspective, uh, I think if people had a choice between uh, prepackaged, blow-dried politicians or people who just say it exactly the way it is, uh, I think they'd pick the latter, and I think that's why we're having the success we've had. But don't you think using that type of verbiage is really disrespectful and speaking from one parent to another how is that a good example for our children? Now, sometimes, you know, folks have to know that if people act in a certain way that they're going to be called out on it. And using direct and blunt language is something that I've done my whole life. It was the way my mother raised me. And so, you know, there can be differences of opinion on that, Christine, and I respect that. But what I'll tell you is, well, here's what the people of New Jersey will know. Uh, I am who I am. 
and I'm not going to change. Uh, and I think they're comfortable with the leadership that I've provided over the last four years in the state. Our next question comes from Alfred Doblin from the record. Um, Governor, if you've nominated an openly gay mayor who supports marriage equality to the state Supreme Court, you were outraged after the suicide of a gay Rutgers student, Tyler Clementi, yet you still object to legalizing same-sex marriage, preferring to see it as a voter referendum. To many gays in New Jersey, these are mixed signals. Can you explain why who someone marries should be put to a voter referendum? Sure, Alfred. I, you know, I understand that people of goodwill can have differences of opinion on this issue, and it's a very contentious one, and it's certainly not one where opinion is not divided. Senator Bono and I have different opinions on this, but I absolutely believe in her goodwill and the fact that she holds that position because she believes that's what's right. In the same way, um, I believe that the institution of marriage for 2,000 years is between a man and a woman. And if we're going to change that core definition of marriage, I don't think that should be decided by 121 politicians in Trenton um, or seven judges on the Supreme Court. It should be decided by the 8.8 .8 million people of New Jersey. And if they do decide to change the definition of marriage by referendum, then I will support that law and enforce that part of the Constitution with the same vigor that I've done over the last four years with every other part. Well, Senator Bono, can you respond to that? Yes, uh, the governor said today at a diner in Edison that he, he equated marriage equality with guns and taxes. It's a human right. I mean, governor, have the courage of, of show a profile in courage and do the right thing for our sons and our daughters, our brothers and our sisters. This is a human right, and it really should not be on the ballot. We should not have the majority of the people decide the minority's rights. It's just wrong. Governor Christie, 30-second rebuttal. Well, listen, 35 other states, 35 of the 50 have put this question on the ballot. And so the idea that this should never be on the ballot is something that is against what 35 other states have done. I trust the people of New Jersey to make this judgment. I don't trust 121 politicians with political agendas who decide these things. Remember, in 2009, the Democratic Party, who's advocating for this now, had control of the State House entirely, and they did not pass marriage equality. Let's not leave this to politicians. Let's put it in the hands of the people to decide. Okay, our next question is from CBS3 anchor Chris May. You both believe that the current $7.25 minimum wage uh, should be raised by a dollar. Uh, Governor, you believe it should be increase over a three-year period. Uh, Senator, you support the November ballot measure that would raise the minimum wage by a dollar almost immediately. But there are a lot of people, including probably some students in our audience, uh, or maybe even older New Jerseyans who are having to go back to work after retirement, that believe they still can't make a living even off of $8.25 an hour. What would you say to them, Senator? I just want to start out by saying that my daughter, who's openly gay, is not a political agenda. And I will say to you to answer this question directly, that I I have a hard time believing that we're even discussing uh, raising the minimum wage from 725 and, and that this governor vetoed it. In this day and age, we live in the highest, one of the highest cost of living states in the nation. This is a starvation wage. And it's true, we need to, it's unfortunate that the governor vetoed this legislation, but people are on living on a minimum wage in New Jersey, well, they're barely being able to make ends meet. There are so many are on public assistance and on food stamps, and unfortunately, this governor's veto is just a reflection of him protecting millionaires and the wealthy and turning his back on the middle class and the working poor and this is a hallmark of his administration. Governor, do you stand by that choice to veto that yes, legislation? I do. I do, and, and this is one of the places where Senator Buono shows her misunderstanding of how to create jobs in New Jersey. You know, the fact is that those costs, those costs that she's talking about, um, the money doesn't come off a magic money tree, Chris. The money comes from the pockets and the hard work of the small business owners, the people who own the convenience stores, the bodegas, that pay that wage. It doesn't come magically from government, and I'm sure that Senator Buono understands that. The fact is, I believe we should increase the minimum wage, and I put it forward a bipartisan compromise to the admit to the legislature. Said, let's raise it over three years. Let's do it responsibly so businesses can plan that expense so that what doesn't happen is what the National Federation of Inter Independent Businesses says, which we could lose up to 30,000 jobs in New Jersey by putting this at $1 at one time and tying it to the inflation rate going forward. It's just an irresponsible thing to do. I believe in raising the wage 
but let's do it responsibly so we don't hurt business who employs these folks from the beginning anyway. All right, thank you. And actually, you know what, I do need to remind the audience that we need to refrain from applause because we do want to make sure that we give each of these candidates due time. I, I, we do have a lot of topics to cover, Sen Senator, so let, let's go ahead and move along. John Scuniagan from the Asbury Park Press. Governor, uh, property taxes. People are considering leaving their homes in part because they can't afford sky-high property taxes. Young people and senior citizens are struggling to afford living in the state because of the property tax, ta taxes. Can you give us two ideas on how the state can fund essential services without relying so much on property taxes? Well, John, first off, let's see where we've been. For the 10 years before I became governor, property taxes went up 70%. We put forward three common sense reforms in a bipartisan way that was adopted by the legislature. A 2% cap on property taxes with very few exceptions, only four, a change to interest arbitration, and encouragement of consolidation and shared services. Now, the two ideas we have to do more with in the next four years is to give civil service reform so that they can consolidate and share more services across municipal and county lines. And secondly, is to make sure that we end this abuse of sick pay throughout the system. Millions and millions of dollars, in fact, one billion dollars in sick pay is pending right now. We can't afford to pay those things anymore. Those two things will help to change the property tax situation significantly in the next four years. And let's remember, property taxes have gone up less than 2% for two years in a row for the first time in 24 years. The Star Ledger gave it the headline at long last tax relief. Senator Christie, you're out of time. Senator Buono? Yes, this governor came into office. He promised not to raise property taxes. He promised not to cut property tax relief. Well, he made state history. He had the largest cut in property tax relief in state history. Property taxes rose on average 20 percent and in other places more. Tom's River, 37 percent. The facts are the facts, rhetorical flourishes aside. And then the governor turns around and he vetoes a, a piece of legislation that would have had millionaires pay their fair share and fund middle class property tax relief. You see, that's a major difference between this governor and myself. I believe that millionaires should pay their fair share and fund middle class property tax relief. He doesn't. I will never balance my budget on the backs of the middle class and the working poor as this governor has done. Governor Christie, do you have a rebuttal? Yeah, no, seconds. I know Senator Bono would never balance her budget that way. I had to balance her budget. When I came in in 2010, after she left a $2.2 billion deficit, and she's raised, voted to raise taxes and fees 154 times. Believe me, everybody, if you give her the opportunity to have this position, here's what will happen. Taxes will increase again and again and again and again. We are going to restrict spending. That's what we've done, and that's why you've had property taxes from 7% annual increase go down to less than 2%. Okay, last rebuttal on this question, Senator Thank Bono. You. This governor came into office and he raised the cruelest tax of all, the tax on the, on the average working family, the property tax, and he raised it by giving millionaires, a, 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 let them off the hook by vetoing legislation. Then he turned around and he raised taxes on the working poor, it was a double whammy. He raised fares on buses and trains by 25%, increasing the cost of commuting and cutting service, and then he raised tolls. I mean, you can call a tax, it's a tax. It may not be called a tax, but it has the same effect. Senator, your time is up. Governor, are you going to run for president? <laughs> what an unusual question. I didn't anticipate that at all, Christine. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, my mother told me a long time ago, Christine, that do the job that you have at the moment the best you possibly can, and your future will take care of itself. And the fact is, people have been talking about me running for president in the state since 2010. They all said I was going to do it in 2012. I said I wouldn't, and I didn't. And, and the fact is, after 2017, I'm going to be looking for a new job anyway. So as we go forward, um, I'm going to continue to do my job the best way I possibly can. And I am not going to declare tonight, Christine, for you or for anybody else, that I am or I'm not running for president. You know what? The people out there in New Jersey don't expect me to. What well, they expect me to do is do my job. Well, point taken, Governor. However, you are asking voters to commit four more years to you, yet you can't make that commitment here tonight. So why should they vote for you? Well, I think people should vote for me if what they like is what's happened for the last four years, and if they believe this type of leadership will continue um, in the next four. 
and I believe it will. And I give my promise to them that I will work as hard as I've worked the last four years to give them the best state they possibly can. A state that I'm extraordinarily proud to be the leader of and a state that we know is doing better and can do even better. But I don't think anybody in America or in the state of New Jersey expects anybody three years away to tell them what they're going to do. Life's too long, Christine. I won't make those decisions till I have to. All right, so we're not making any headlines tonight. Barbara Bono, excuse me, Senator Bono, I do would like to give you time to respond. 30 well, you know, seconds. Governor, it doesn't bother me that you're running for president. What bothers me is how you're running for president. You're sacrificing the safety of our children by vetoing common sense gun legislation just to cater to the NRA. You're sacrificing the health of our women by vetoing funding for Planned Parenthood. And, you know, that's because the national conservative base of the Republican Party has declared this war on Planned Parenthood. And you know what? You're, you are compromising and sacrificing the dignity of our gay brothers and sisters by vetoing marriage equality because you know that would kill you Senator, in Republican Senator, you're out of time. Quick rebuttal, Governor. Uh, listen, um, the only person obsessed with 2016 on this stage is Senator Buono. She sends more time talking about that than she spends talking about time that she's going to spend if she ever did become governor and try to make the state a better place. Um, I can walk and chew gum at the same time, Christine. Uh, I can do this job and also deal with my future, and that's exactly what I will do. All right, let's move on to another topic. This one comes from Alfred Doblin from The Record. Well, Senator Buono, regardless of the presidential ambitions of anybody in this room on this stage or near us right now, governors in New Jersey do not always complete their terms. Governors Whitman and McGreevy resigned. Governor Corzine was incapacitated after a car accident, and the result was the state created the office of lieutenant governor. Now, your choice for that position is Millie Silva, a longtime labor organizer, but she's never held public office. How is she qualified to run the state of New Jersey if you are elected? Yes, when I, I announced her, the governor said that she was wholly unqualified, and if we're talking about qualifications, I question how he thinks his record qualifies him for a second term. But in terms of Millie Silva, she is eminently qualified. This is a woman who is highly educated, who has brings a skill set to state government that I think is sorely needed. She has negotiated uh, contracts worth in the t millions of dollars and brings a, a sense of she's able to negotiate, to compromise, to consensus build. Now, I don't know about you, Governor, but I think that's a skill that we need in Trenton. Governor, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think we do need consensus building in Trenton, and that's what we've been doing in a bipartisan way for the last three and a half years. Senator Bona wouldn't know about that because she hasn't been a part of it. She voted against pension and benefit reform that we fought hard to get, and that's going to save the pensions of our pensioners and save $120 billion for the taxpayers. And as far as my lieutenant governor, there's nobody questioning whether she's qualified. A former federal prosecutor, a former council person, a former county sheriff, and the person who has led the fight to create jobs in the state, 143,000 new private sector jobs since we were elected. Our next question from Chris May, CBS3 anchor. Well, as we gather here tonight, the federal government is shut down and it is shut down all over one issue, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Governor, you chose to make New Jersey one of 33 states uh, that did not set up its own health insurance exchange. Your critics say that that means fewer people will sign up and that the uninsured will thus continue to flock to emergency rooms. How is that good for New Jersey? And was your decision on this simply a political maneuver that was designed to strike a blow against Obamacare? Well, uh, Chris, uh, I don't agree with the premise of your question. Um, the fact is that the federal government, the Obama administration, gave us three options to enforce the Affordable Care Act. A state partnership, a state uh, partnership, a federal one, or a joint. We, along with 32 other states, decided to allow the federal government to run the exchange in our state. If the Obama administration didn't believe that that was a viable way to run it, then they shouldn't have included it in the legislation. I think they do think it's viable, and that's why they did include it. Not only that, but this is the administration that also expanded Medicaid so that more of our poor in this state can have access to health care. And so these are not partisan decisions we've made. These are bipartisan decisions, enforcing the law and making sure that we do the right thing by the people of the state who need health care. That's why we expanded funding also to federally qualified health centers to the highest level ever in this state. People have access to care along with us not cutting the funding to our hospitals, in fact, increasing it during my four years. 
health care is more available in New Jersey under this administration. Governor, you're out of time. Senator Bono, you can respond. 30 seconds. Now, this governor has thwarted uh, the Affordable Care Act in New Jersey, and as a, as a result of not having a state-run exchange, there's less savings and less choices and less money to reach out to people to, for, out, for outreach to let them know that there is a choice. But let me say this. The federal government was shut down, and this governor's decision is based on, the, on appealing to that Tea Party element that has the, his, the grip of his party, and they have shut down government and uh, really uh, put the, the American democracy in a vice for one reason, because they don't have the votes Senator to Bono, change the Affordable Care Act. Sorry to cut you off there. That's been 30 seconds. Governor, I, I will give you one more rebuttal on this. Sure. Um, you know, the fact is that we've enforced the law here in New Jersey, and we've expanded Medicaid in New Jersey, and we've made health care more available to folks, more available than it was before I became governor, by increasing funding to hospitals, by increasing funding to federally qualified health centers, and by allowing the federal government to come in and set up an insurance exchange effective October 1st. We've complied with the law completely. I don't agree with the law, but we've complied with it, and that's the job you have as governor. You don't always agree with every law you have to enforce, but I've enforced this one, and I'm proud of our record on health care. I think we've done a great job. Our next question from John Scuniagan, representing the Asbury Park Press tonight. Senator, the governor approved a bill that allows some sick children to use marijuana. What about legalizing marijuana and taxing it? A recent study says legalizing and taxing marijuana in New Jersey would generate $83 million in revenue. No, you're right. The governor has thwarted uh, the, the uh, medicinal marijuana, and I think it's just reprehensible. There are people, we passed the law, it was signed into law, and the governor's done everything in his power to thwart uh, its implementation. With respect to legalization of marijuana, I don't support it. I, I support uh, the decriminalization of small amounts of marijuana, however. Governor? Well, uh, first off on medicinal marijuana, let me say this. I'm proud of the way we've implemented this, and um, I don't know how we define thwarting it, but we just gave a grant last week through the Economic Development Authority to help build another medical marijuana center. So that doesn't seem to me to be thwarting the uh, implementation of medical marijuana. But let me be really clear. As the former United States attorney, as someone who was in charge of enforcing federal laws in this state uh, for seven years before I became governor, I do not favor the legalization of marijuana, I do not favor the decriminalization of marijuana. We are okay with using it for medical purposes, but I do not want my children or the children of New Jersey to believe that using marijuana should, is right or legal. I don't believe in decriminalization or legalization. As long as I'm governor, it will not happen. I would like to address the New Jersey economy now with both candidates. Governor, first let's break down the progress of New Jersey's economy since you've been in office. A lot of information, so bear with me here. These figures, I do want to let you both know, come from the Bloomberg economy economic valuation of states. And here they are. They found that employment is up, tax revenue is up, and personal income is also up. However, looking at New Jersey's growth compared to other states, it ranks near the bottom in all three categories. Both both employment and tax revenue rank 44th among 50 states, and personal income had the third smallest increase in the nation. Why are we at the bottom of the pack? Well, uh, let's say this. Remember where we were, Christine, when we came into office. We were ranked 50th in terms of tax taxes in the, in the country. We were ranked at the bottom of the barrel for business friendliness. We had had a hole dug for us by the administration of John Corzine and by people like Barbara Bono in the uh, Senate Budget Committee um, that had a $13 billion deficit that we inherited and had to fix in the first six months in office. And so we have dug out of quite the hole in New Jersey. Unemployment was over 10% when we became governor, and so we've worked hard, and we're proud of what we've done. Cut business taxes, $2.3 billion, 143,000 new private sector jobs, and tax revenue going up. And so the New Jersey comeback has begun, and the fact is it's not over. Uh, it's not over, and it's going to get better if we continue to stay the course. If we go back to the days of the Corzine Buono years, where quarter of a million jobs were lost, where budgets were unbalanced, where 154 tax and fee increases were done and voted for by Senator Bono. That's not going to make New Jersey better. This is a clear choice. Senator Bono, I do have a part B to this question. However, I do want to give you 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> New Jersey lags the nation in economic growth for one reason and one reason alone. Chris Christie's failed supply-side, trickle-down, Romney-style economics, which gives, it's the sum and substance of his economic plan, is to give tax credits to corporations, 2.1 billion, and we have, it's landed us where? 
the bottom of the barrel in economic growth, 44th in job growth. Okay, well, even, the, even Mississippi, I think, is doing better than us. And the fact is, this governor likes to, any time somebody points to the hole that we're in with our economy, he's in lightning speed. He points to his predecessor. He points to Democrats. Just recently, he pointed to a low-level New Jersey Transit employee. And the fact is, Governor, you have to man up. You've been in office for four years. It's time to own your record and defend your record. Governor Christie. Well, I find it interesting tonight. You know, uh, there are people who want to be bipartisan and people who want to be partisan. There's people who want to reach across the aisle and people who want to stand in a partisan corner with their special interest group support. The most interesting thing I find is Senator Buono's criticism of the use of tax credits. Every one of the tax credit plans that we've implemented, she voted for. So apparently she was for it before she was against it. And we've heard that before, haven't we? All right, I do want to get to part B of my question. And part B of my question is directed to you, Senator Buono. The Christie campaign says that when you were chairman of the Budget Committee in 2010, New Jersey lost 250,000 private sector jobs. And unemployment rose from 4.6% to 9.7%. So don't you feel as though you share some of the responsibility? You know, when I was chair of the Budget Committee during 2008 and 2009, it was in the midst of the, of the global meltdown. This is the worst economic recession in modern history. And I do support tax credits as a piece of economic uh, development, of uh, growing our economy. It, it cannot be the sum and substance. And some of those credits have to go to small businesses, many of them small and minority owned. This governor has ignored small businesses and left them behind. My administration would help small businesses. And I don't call bipartisanship uh, when this governor called a bipartisan piece of package of job bills a pile of crap. I guess it's bye-bye bipartisanship. Let's move on. I think it's a good time. Alfred Doblin from the record. Um, Senator Buono, um, it, Atlantic City gambling revenues have declined every year since 2006. Increasingly gamblers are going to other states, Pennsylvania, New York. Is it time to expand gambling to, to other parts of New Jersey, particularly the Meadowlands? Look, Atlantic City is very important, not just to our regional economy, but to our entire state economy. And the reason that its revenues are down, and it does fund some very important programs, is because of cannibalization, but also because of the economy. We have 400,000 people out of work, the highest unemployment in the region, the lowest rate of job growth in the region. People don't have disposable income to go to Atlantic City and gamble. I mean, they barely can put food on the table and make sure there's gas in their car. So what we need to do is focus on an economic plan that builds from the middle class out, one that doesn't, uh, isn't a trickle-down, supply-side, discredited form of uh, economic rebuilding that just hasn't worked. But, but it's been Senator, a failure. People are gambling. I mean, they are gambling in Pennsylvania. They are gambling in New York. They may gamble more in New York. So the question still is, how do we keep some of those gaming dollars in New Jersey? Well, the legislature has, has made some progress. We passed internet gaming, uh, and you know there are some ways that we can try and enhance Atlantic City as a destination resort. But the fact of the matter is, if, if our economy is in the tank, which it is, people aren't, there, there's gonna be less people with disposable income to spend it on gambling. Governor Christie, well, you will get one minute for this question. Sorry, I didn't you will get one minute for this sure. question. Uh, Alfred, listen. Uh, when we took over in 2010, uh, Atlantic City was in bad shape in every way you can imagine. Uh, crime was high, uh, desperation was significant in that city. And so I came together in a bipartisan way with Senate President Sweeney and we passed a plan in December of 2010 and said we were gonna make a commitment. That we're gonna have a five year commitment to Atlantic City to do everything that we could to try to make sure that it got back on its feet and started going. Now, there are some things that are positive, Albert, Alfred, as you know, while gaming revenue is down, non-gaming revenue is up. We need to transform Atlantic City from purely a gaming destination to a resort destination, to a convention destination that has other things to offer other than just gaming. And I think we're making progress in doing that. Enough progress? Not yet. But we're only halfway in 
to the plan, the bipartisan plan that Senate President Sweeney and I are doing together. I want to give Atlantic City a full chance to succeed. At the end of the next two and a half years, if we haven't seen the kind of progress, then we're going to need to revisit with the legislature in a bipartisan way, um, gaming in other places in I New Jersey. But we Governor, don't need to I'm do sorry, that now. We're out of time. Chris May, CBS 3 News anchor, has the next question. I want to return to a topic that uh, Senator Buono brought up a moment ago. Uh, New Jersey Transit Governor did lose a third of its fleet during Superstorm Sandy because unlike other transit systems, they did not uh, move their fleet to higher ground. And yet no one at New Jersey Transit has been held publicly accountable. You did tell an editorial board recently that the responsibility for this rested with a middle manager. Uh, but at this point, shouldn't the public expect more from you and your administration than to say that the buck stops with a middle manager? No, what the public has a right to know, Chris, is what really happened. Now, if what we want to do is just scapegoat people um, for the sake of scapegoating them, we could do that. Uh, and that's typical politics. Um, we're not going to be engaged in that. You know, let's remember, October 30th, 2012, 365,000 homes destroyed, 7 million New Jerseyans without power, every school in New Jersey closed. We were confronting the biggest natural disaster crisis the state has ever seen. And there were some mistakes made along the way and some good things done as well. I am not going to scapegoat people who weren't responsible for what happened. Now, the fact is, we found the folks who were responsible. He's been demoted. And we're moving on. Uh, and, you know, if someone wants me to do a public hanging, I'm not going to do that, Chris. Um, that's not the way you build a team. That's not leadership. And that's not what's caused New Jerseyans to be so optimistic about our ability to recover from Sandy. Uh, and I'm not going to engage in that kind of conduct. Senator, would someone have been held accountable at a higher level had you been governor? Well, you know, the, there should be an investigation, and the governor has scapegoated someone. He scapegoated a mid-level New Jersey Transit employee who is singularly supposed to be responsible for moving all of these trains to a swamp. And when we know, in fact, from newspaper reports that there were many emails indicating that those higher up did take responsibility or were involved in that decision. It strains credulity, but we need to have a full accounting, just like we need to have a full accounting of why those two lanes were closed going from Fort Lee over the George Washington Bridge and the Port Authority's executive director, uh, Mr. Foy, said it was unexplained. He ended it and he said he thinks it was illegal. We need a full accounting of that as well. John Skinny Youngen from Asbury Park Press has our next question. Governor, continuing on with Superstorm Sandy, uh, we're almost at the one-year anniversary of the storm. Thousands of families are still place, displaced. There's been criticism of a lack of transparency in how the federal resettlement, resettlement money is being dispersed. Victims have said the paperwork is onerous and discouraging. Business owners worry that their livelihoods are hopelessly broken. How can the progress so far be considered a success? Well, because, John, I lived through it, and I saw what happened. 365,000 homes damaged or destroyed, 7 million people without power, every school in New Jersey closed, almost all of our major highways closed. Uh, I lived it. I sat at the table trying to make sure that we got back from this. And yes, we still have people who are not in their homes, but I don't think anybody in New Jersey expected that a storm that destroyed or damaged 365,000 homes uh, would all be rebuilt inside 11 months. And yes, there are some real onerous regulations that have been put on us by the federal government because of the waste of billions of dollars after Katrina. That's the federal government's decision, and we need to comply with those rules to make sure money isn't wasted. And on the issue of transparency, every dollar that's being spent of the federal money is on a website that's accessible to everyone from the state controller's office. And so we're continuing to make progress. I'm proud of what we've done, but most importantly, I'm proud of the people of New Jersey who have pulled together in an unprecedented way to help us recover from the storm. Governor, you're out of time. Senator Bono, we did want to have your opportunity now. Can the progress so far be considered a success? You know, I, I wish there were there was more to celebrate. You know, we are a year out, and Governor, we all lived through it. And unfortunately, there are thousands of people who are still living in trailers and in trauma. It's all well and good that we rebuilt the boardwalk. That's a good thing. But there are so many people, thousands, who are having 
having a hard time rebuilding their lives. And state government has not acted fast enough. They call, if the governor had come or sent one of his representatives to at least one of the hearings that we had at the state house, he would have heard victim stories. Uh, one of the women, uh, you know, an elderly woman, is afraid to leave her home that's uninhabitable because it's being looted. I mean, these are the sorts of things that this governor needs to address. And state government is giving them no answers, no help. One woman said she has two jobs, her day job and then coming home at night trying to, to sift her way through all of the paperwork that she has and she has, she's gotten no answers. We need a governor that's also going to stand up to the insurance companies. These people have been victimized by their insurance companies. Governor Senator, Cuomo you're out set of time. the stage. You're out of time, Senator, but I, I do need to give you uh, some sure. time to Sure, to you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people have returned to their homes. Um, but Senator Buono does not want to celebrate that. Uh, and as far as insurance companies, uh, the insurance companies in New Jersey that are regulated by New Jersey have stood up and paid the claims. It's the National Flood Insurance Plan, which is a part of the big government bloat in Washington, D.C. that took over an entire industry, the flood insurance industry. This shows you why government should not be in charge of these things. That's why the private industry should be in charge of it, not government. Well, we thought it would be a good idea here tonight to get the students involved. Great. So right now we're going to introduce you to a student here at William Patterson University who will ask the candidates a question now. Her name is Lisa Sworn. She is a senior majoring in biology and her question will go to Senator Buono first. Lisa? Good evening. My question is, according to NewJerseySpotlight.com, over the past decade, New Jersey has dramatically cut funding for public higher education. As a direct result of this, colleges have raised tuition on already cash-strapped students. What will you do to make higher education more affordable for students and their families? That is a huge priority of mine because, you know, I was, I put myself through college and law school. I was on my own since I was 19 and let me tell you, I wouldn't be standing here running for governor of the state of New Jersey if I didn't have good public institutions of higher learning right here in New Jersey that I was able to afford Montclair State Rutgers Law School. But you know what? Today, I couldn't do it. The tuition at Rutgers Law School is over $40,000, and there's something wrong with that picture. The jobs of today require more education, more training, and we need to make pro uh, higher education a priority. This governor came into office and cut funding for higher education, 103, $173 million. Cost of going to Rutgers, up 14% his first four years in office. And you know what? When I'm governor, I'm going to make higher education a priority because all of our kids, middle class, working poor, they deserve the right to live up to their full potential too. Governor Christie, you have one minute. Sure. Uh, I appreciate your question as well. And, and this is one of those areas where um, instead of just talking about it, we've actually done something. You know, for 25 years, New Jersey had not invested capital money in institutions like William Patterson and others across New Jersey. No new laboratories, no new classrooms, no seed expansion so that more people could go here. Um, I said that's wrong. And right now we're in the midst of a $1.3 billion investment in our state's colleges and universities. 176 different projects being funded across the state that's going to expand laboratory space, classroom space, so that more kids can come to New Jersey and can, and can afford college in New Jersey. Um, this is a big difference in this race. You can talk about it all you like, but you know the senator's been in the legislature for 20 years. She never did anything about it. We've come into office and actually done something about it by investing $1.3 billion in our state's higher education institutions. I'm proud of that, and I hope it's going to give more students in New Jersey an opportunity to go to school in New Jersey if they want and pursue any, any discipline they want in a 21st century way. Thank you, Lisa Sworn, for your question. Right now, we would like to give each candidate the opportunity to ask each other a question. Senator Buono, do you have a question for Governor Christie? Governor, a few months ago, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act, which protects poor and minorities' right to vote. At the time, you were asked numerous times what your opinion was, and you failed to respond. And in the aftermath of the Voting Rights Act, Republican governors across the country are restricting the rights of poor minority voters uh, to exercise their right to vote. Are you ready to give an opinion? Was the Supreme Court wrong to gut the Voting Rights Act? Well, I know you're talking about other Republican governors, but you're not talking about this one because this Republican governor has not moved one inch to restrict people's right to vote. In fact, what we've done is make sure that people have a full opportunity to vote. In fact, tonight as we speak, people are voting in New Jersey. 
vote by mail ballots are out and people can now vote in New Jersey as we speak. And so uh, I'd rather, instead of giving opinions, rather let my conduct show what my record is. And my conduct has been this. We're encouraging people to vote. We want people to vote. I want as many people to vote. Believe me, on November 5th, I want as many people out there to vote as they possibly can. And we're looking forward to that vote and we're looking forward to the result. Governor Christie, your question for Senator Buono. Um, Senator, we've, uh, we've chronicled for the public um, your 154 votes to raise taxes and fees. Um, is there one of them that you regret? Governor, you know that, <laughs> Governor, you know that any administration including yourself, has to find revenues to support a budget. The difference is who pays and how they pay for it. And you came into office and raised the cruelest tax of all, the property tax on the middle class, on average families. You raised taxes on the working poor. You raised the fares for com uh, 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 commuters. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Governor, I will never balance my, back, my budget on the backs of the working poor and the middle class as you did. Your whole tenure has been to support and to protect millionaires at the expense of the middle class and the working poor. You are the last person to talk about taxes to anyone. It's a good time to move on to our lightning round, our speed round, like we have to call it. Senator, have you ever voted for a Republican? And if so, who? Republican. No. <laughs> Governor, have you ever voted for a Democrat? And if so, who? I haven't, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> Senator? Tell us one thing that you like about the governor. Well, he's good on late night TV, he's just not so good in New Jersey. <laughs> governor, one thing that you like about Senator Bono? She's obviously a good and caring mother and someone who cares deeply about public service in the state because she's dedicated a lot of her life to it. And while we have policy disagreements, Christine, I would never denigrate her service. And I think we need more people who care enough about our communities to be able to stand up and do the job that she's done over the last 20 years. comfortable making your medical records public to prove that you are fit to serve four years. Governor, let's I, I think talk. both of us had trouble hearing that well, over I the I apologize. Over you know, we have a very applause. feisty crowd here tonight. Yes, yes And I they're know. really into it, but I do want to remind our audience that it does inhibit our candidates to hear the questions, and it also does take away their time to respond, so we'll cheer afterwards, all right? Okay. Governor, Senator, would you be comfortable making your medical records public to prove that you are fit to serve four more years? Governor, I'll let you take this one first. Sure. I mean, you know, listen, um, I'm happy to make medical, medical reports public. Um, and, uh, you know, fact is uh, that people see whether you're fit for the job by whether you can do the job or not. And people have watched me over the last four years do the job under some really significantly difficult circumstances uh, and come to work every day and work as hard as I can for the people of this state. So if anybody's really concerned about my health, I'd be happy to show them a report from my doctor anytime they ask. Senator, would you be comfortable? Boy, if he didn't denigrate my public service tonight, I sure don't want to see when he does. Uh, but um, I'm a, you know, my dad died when he was only 51 of a heart attack and my mom had a stroke. So I, I have a, that in my in my risk pool so I've been a runner from you know in my 20s really would to you reduce be comfortable making your medical oh, yes, records yes, public. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm an avid runner I really um, uh, I, I, I put a lot of effort into staying well healthy and because I have six kids and I certainly don't want to be there for them there's a 50 50 chance I probably will get this question right and I'm pretty sure I will but governor Springsteen or Bon Jovi and she I like them both but I'm a Springsteen guy what's your favorite song my favorite song, Thunder Road. Thunder Road. Senator, Springsteen or Bon Jovi? I like both of them, but I, I prefer R&B. R&B? All right. <laughs> favorite R&B song? What's that? Favorite R&B song? Oh, I don't know. I, um, I love Beyonce. Oh, yeah, Beyonce. I love that. <laughs> All yeah. right. Our next question from Alfred Doblin. Governor, um, you killed the, the ARC tunnel, um, citing uh, expected cost overruns. But the project would have created a new Trans-Hudson Tunnel. Um, ridership is expected to go up significantly. Um, it's estimated 38% by 2030. Um, there are many pro uh, proposals out there, the Gateway Project, possible extension of the seven. Um, what's your particular plan to handle that increase? And, and would you put your political capital behind one of these plans? 
Uh, Mr. Alfred, not only would I put my political capital behind one of the plants, we've put actual capital behind the plants. We've um, contributed money in a, in a bi-state way with the state of New York to uh, have engineering studies of the extension of the number seven train. We are working with Amtrak on the Gateway Tunnel. Uh, and so we absolutely believe that there needs to be a tunnel. But here's the criteria, Alfred, which both the seven and the Gateway, if done correctly, could meet. Um, it needs to allow people, once they get to New York City, to get to someplace else. The Arc Tunnel was going to the basement of Macy's, eight floors below, two billion dollars just on the terminal was gonna be spent, and the cost overruns were three to five billion dollars. And here's the worst part. The deal negotiated by the Corazon administration made New Jersey solely responsible for all the cost overruns, not the federal government, not the state of New York. In fact, the state of New York and the city of New York paid nothing towards the Arc Tunnel. Now listen, I'm all for a tunnel that goes to New York City, but not one that's paid for solely on the backs of the people of New Jersey. If New York wants to partner with us, we're ready to do it. Um, Senator Bono, do you have a plan and could you be specific in what you might support? Absolutely. This governor's pl plan to pull out of the Arc Tunnel is just another example of him his putting his national ambitions ahead of what's good for New Jersey. The conservative base of the Republican Party does not like big infrastructure plans. And so you don't have to wonder why we have we have the highest unemployment in the region. This would have provided 40,000 permanent jobs, not to mention 6,000 construction jobs. You know, the governor didn't have a new cost estimate. The government accounting office came out after he gave his reasons. He said there was a new cost estimate that showed that New Jersey was going to have to pay for cost overruns. Well, that was shown not to be true. The transportation secretary, Ray LaHood, came to New Jersey at least twice to try and allay New Jersey's fears, but this governor was convinced that he needed to do this, pull the plug on the Arc Tunnel, to preserve his viability as a candidate for Republican governor, and we all know it. Chris May, CBS 3 News anchor, has our next question. Uh, governor, there have been serious questions about the competence of Rutgers University President Robert Barchi in the wake of a scandal which led to the firing of the basketball coach and a top lawyer for the university, the forced resignation of the athletic director, and the hiring of an athletic director who many believe in retrospect is not suited for the job. What is behind your unwavering support of a man who some say has mishandled several scandals under his watch? Uh, uh, my support for Bob Barchi is because he was the best man for the job. And he continues to be the best man for the job. Uh, he has shepherded this university through the largest public institution merger in the history of the United States. In one year, he brought forward the merger of Rutgers and UMDNJ to take it from 55th in research dollars in the country to 22nd. Bob Barchi is a bright man, a brilliant professor, and a great leader for Rutgers University. Most of these problems that you referenced happened before he even got there. And when he did get there, he dealt with it in a forthright way. And so I support Bob Barchi because he's the best man for the job and he's leading Rutgers from good to great. Senator? I couldn't disagree more. Uh, I think I lost confidence in, uh, in Barkey uh, when he admitted that he didn't look at the video that showed this uh, athletic director abusing abusing these students. You know, I, I'm a, a proud alumna of Rutgers Law School, and I think that unfortunately, the Rutgers reputation was dragged through the mud. It was headline after headline. If I were governor, I would have had them all in my office. We would have settled it from the get-go, and it wouldn't have gone on for as long as it has. But Barchi has shown a lack of la a leader, brilliant leader. No. He's the opposite of a brilliant leader. This is a man who has fallen down on the job time and time again, and unfortunately, Rutgers' reputation has suffered, and hopefully that's just in the short term. Governor, 30 seconds. Well, listen, the fact is very simple. When Bob Barchi had an athletic director who he put in charge of supervising this coach, he left it to the athletic director to handle it. It's called delegation of responsibility. and. President Barchi relied upon the athletic director's judgment. The athletic director made a judgment. And when that judgment was proven to be wrong, that athletic director resigned and the coach was terminated. And now we've moved forward. And, and by the way, Chris, I didn't get to address this. I think Julie Herman's going to be an outstanding athletic director for Rutgers. And I think the premise of that part is wrong. John Scooter Youngen from the Asbury Park Press. Senator, <clears throat> the opiate problem ranging from Oxycontin to heroin is exploding in the New Jersey suburbs and in its cities. What strategy do you think will stem it, and what are you committed to doing about it? 
You know, I, um, I used to be a public defender. I know um, I've been involved in, in many, many criminal cases. And yes, you're right, the, the misuse of prescription drugs is endemic. Uh, it's even, uh, I think, in our suburbs, even even more so. We need to uh, hold doctors accountable who are overprescribing it, and I think that we need to ensure that pharmacies. I think we need to have oversight over pharmacies to make sure that people don't go to multiple pharmacies and uh, try and get uh, these uh, drugs that are incredibly addictive. So we need to have a whole plan. We really need to have a comprehensive plan to address it because it's not going away. Governor Christie, you do have one minute. John, uh, this is another area of our record over the last four years that I'm extremely proud of. Uh, I've been a prosecutor for seven years before I became governor. And what I know is that drug addiction is an illness. It's a disease. And we need to treat the disease. And that's why I put forward a plan to end mandatory prison sentences for first-time nonviolent drug offenders and instead make treatment mandatory. And we're phasing that plan in over five years. We're two years into it. And every county in this state will now have the opportunity for first-time nonviolent offenders to go to treatment. $49,000 a year to put them in jail, $24,000 a year to have them in treatment. No life is disposable, John. And what we need to do is to deal on the treatment side of this to make sure that those people who have these problems can be given the tools to deal with them and become better fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. That's the way you deal with the drug problem in the state. Make treatment more available, and that's what we've done in a bipartisan way, and I'm proud of it. We have another student here at William Patterson University that would like to ask both of you a question. Her name is Megan Murray. She is a senior here. She's majoring in business administration and marketing. Her question will go to the governor first. Megan? Good evening. As of August 2013, the unemployment rate for the state of New Jersey was at 8.5% compared to the national average, which was at 7.3%. What do you pro propose to do about jobs in the state, especially for graduating college students such as myself? Well, what we've done is to have the unemployment rate go down over 1.2% just in the last year. Um, in 2012, New Jersey had its greatest year of private sector job growth since the year 2000. And 143,000 new private sector jobs have been created. Now, we have more work to do. We have to make the tax structure in the state more affordable so people have more money to be able to help to create jobs in the state. We need to make sure that we invest in higher education, as we're doing with our $1.3 billion capital investment, so that so our children in our state, when they go to college, can now wind up being better trained and better prepared for the new jobs of the 21st century. And this Rutgers merger that we did is already showing that we're going to get more research dollars into the state, which create more jobs as well. That's what we need to do. Make our taxes more affordable, more investment in higher education, and more partnerships with the private sector. Senator, you do have one minute. 400,000 out of work, the highest unemployment and the lowest job creation in the region. New Jersey actually dropped in rankings as a good place to do business. We are now one of the 10 worst states to do business in. Our middle class has shrunk. Poverty is at a 52-year high. You know, what we need to do is we need to take a, a, take a different course, chart a different course from this governor's failed Romney-style trickle-down uh, economics of giving tax credits to corporations. It hasn't worked. We've landed at the bottom of the barrel, so we have to chart a different course. My economic plan recognizes that we have to grow an economy from the middle class out. What does that mean? That means that we invest in our students and our schools and small businesses, that we direct some of those tax credits and help to small businesses that are, so many of them are small and minority owned. And we need to fund our infrastructure needs. We need to find innovative ways to fund our infrastructure because we know that a strong infrastructure means a strong Senator and Bono, healthy economy. Senator you're out of time. We are, our clock is ticking down. Our next question is from Alfred Doblin. And uh, I would ask both of you to limit this to 30 seconds in response as we try to, to get through this. Okay. Um, Senator Bono, if New Jersey were to allow parents to obtain vouchers to send their children to any public or private school, would this undermine our system of public education or would it force the needed improvements in underperforming districts? 
It would certainly undermine it. You know, um, I am a proud graduate of public schools, and we need to, we need, this governor's over-reliance on vouchers, his support of vouchers, reflects that he believes that public schools aren't worth fixing. Uh, he couldn't be more wrong. And I believe that you build up our public schools by funding them according to the School Funding Reform Act, and by, you, you also close the achievement gap by investing in preschool. We know that that's what works. Universal preschool, Very and it's not 30 seconds. I've got to give it over to you. Now, apologize for an uh, Alfred, listen, it's very clear to me. Uh, we have 200 family schools in New Jersey, and there's only one candidate on this stage who said that's not a bad percentage, and it's Senator Bono. We need to try to change what's going on in our failing schools, and I'm an advocate for vouchers in failing school districts to create competition, but most importantly, to give those parents and those children a choice to walk out of those failure factories and reach their full God-given potential. Children should be put before the interest of adults. Believe it or not, believe it or not, it is time. I'm sorry, but believe it or not, it's time for closing statements already. So by coin toss, Governor Christie, you go first. Well, Christine, Alfred, Chris, John, uh, the folks here at William Patterson, thank you uh, for sponsoring tonight. And uh, I am a, I'm a proud, proud New Jerseyan. And I remember growing up in Livingston, my mother used to tell my brother and sister and I, um, be yourself. Because then tomorrow you won't worry, you don't have to worry about trying to remember who you pretended to be yesterday. For four years, I've been myself to the people of New Jersey. I've told them the truth about the problems that we had, inheriting a $13 billion deficit and balancing it without raising taxes on anyone, making sure that we have the most education funding ever, and reaching across the aisle in a bipartisan way to bring solutions. That's why I'm endorsed by 49 Democratic elected officials. That's why we've been able to get things done in Trenton compared to what's going on in Washington, D.C. What I promise you, if you give me another four years, is I will be myself. I will tell you the truth. I will work as hard as I can because there's no greater honor and privilege I could ever, ever ask for in my life than to be the governor of the state where I was born and raised. Senator I ask for your vote. Thank you. My father came to this country when he... Can you start audience, it again? Audience, we'll start it again. Go ahead. My father came to this country when he was three years old. His parents, my grandparents, didn't speak any English and they had little formal education, but they knew in the United States their son would have opportunity. And so today, the daughter of James Buono, an Italian immigrant butcher, is running for governor. Now that's the American dream. The belief that no matter what your circumstances, that your children can have the hope for a better tomorrow. That fight for a better tomorrow was why I'm running. Four years ago, we have the highest unemployment in the region. Today, with 400,000 out of work, we still do. You know, it's time to put New Jersey first, to bring good jobs back to New Jersey, and put New Jersey first. You know, and I'm going to be the kind of governor that will do that. I will lift up the middle class. I will put New Jersey back on the road to prosperity. And the way I'll do that is the way that has always worked, by building up a strong middle class. Thank you very much. And we would like to thank the candidates for being here this evening. I also want to thank my colleagues, Alfred Dalbrun, Chris May, and John Skinniagan, for being here with me alongside at this table. I also would like to thank William Patterson University for hosting us here this evening. A reminder to everyone here, Election Day is Tuesday, November 5th. Your vote does count. For now, I'm Christine Johnson. Join us on CBS 2 in New York and also on CBS 3 in Philadelphia for the news at 11 o'clock. Have a good evening.